Well, good day, everybody. Welcome to Faith Seeking Understanding. I am Alan Bevere, your host. I am a pastor, retired, professor, Bible moth, theologian in exile, and peddler of hope. And I am also the self-appointed Anselm of Canterbury Chair of Podcast Theology and Culture at Faith Seeking Understanding University, a completely made-up university where all seekers are invited to ponder profound things free of charge. And I am very happy on this show, one of five shows we produce here, called Believing is Seeing. And I'm very happy to have my friend, Dr. Jason Barnhart. Jason is the um, Assistant Professor of Historical Theology at Ashland Theological Seminary in Ashland, Ohio. Um, and uh, he is... Uh, his dissertation is in the works, or it has been published. Has it, it been has published? been published. All I right. Published. Yep. It, uh, and uh, it's, uh, what's the title? <laughs> Gosh, the, the title is, is such an academic title. Uh, Word, Spirit, Communal Revelationalism, the Brethren Evangelical Theological Epistemology of Dr. J. Allen Miller. Right. Uh, Which, as we all know for dissertations, <laughs> my dissertation included, will be read by dozens Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's uh, I, I'm in the works right now to have an audible version. Uh, so yeah. we'll see okay, if Morgan good. Freeman will actually read the read it for you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think it's great. Yeah. Morgan will make it sound like really good anyway. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm sure it's excellent. I'm sure it's excellent. But also you blog at Brethren Contemplative on Substack. Mm -hmm. um, friends, we're going to put uh, links to Jason's stuff in our description, both on the YouTube channel and on the podcast. Uh, so you have links to that, but you write much more uh, popular stuff there when you talk through it, right? Yes. Um, is it is you know it's interesting your Substack is it a blog or a newsletter? Because it's interesting that a lot Substack advertises itself as like a newsletter, but you know my my Substack uh, isn't a newsletter. I don't post. You know, we went out for Chinese on Christmas Day because the Bumpus's dogs ate the turkey. You know, I, you know right? <laughs> Uh, you're right. But so you're more of a blog kind of a thing. Yeah, Substack began as as kind of more of a newsletter kind of format, and it's yeah. really evolved into uh, yeah. a format to do blogging. Uh, yeah. And so people can subscribe and the blog comes directly to your email. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've so got actually, I, I found out through other people who are blogging through it. Yeah, that's what I'm doing on mine. And I, by the way, I recommended your Substack. Hint, hint, hint. Recommended it. And uh <laughs> anyway yes. and you chair the christian history and theology department at ashton seminary and i am a member of that department my condolences yes, friends to you. pray for me pray for me yeah my condolences to you so as we get into our conversation which is pietism heartfelt <laughs> faith or humbug um you know as we as we begin to get into that i have to say i have to say for those of us who know you and I, both of us, uh, when they find out you and I have, have had a discussion on pietism, they're going to be rolling in the, on the floor because I, I can't speak for you. Piety is not a word people have used to describe me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I'm a firm believer it, that piet, piety and humor do go together. So it's more of a misconception of pietism. And that's what we're going to talk about. And in fact, let's begin with that. Mm -hmm. Um I think when some people hear piety, I'm going to ask you to define pietism here. Uh, but when they think of someone who is pious, um, they think of someone who has no sense of humor uh, and who walks around with their nose in the air and looking like they've been sucking on sour lemons all day. Right. Yeah. This, yeah. this is this is sort of the typical caricature of pietism. And by the way, not to say there have been some people who have embodied this caricature. <laughs> uh, so as we get into this conversation, how would you define pietism? Yeah. It, uh, well, it's it's interesting. There's a lot of uh, current research in pietism because pietism has so often been defined by the people who were against it. Um, and so you've, you've kind of given a good description there. Uh, but pietism, I... I take a little bit of a different approach. You can, as the historical theologian, you could say pietism is a movement uh, that begins in Reformation era Europe. 
uh, to recapture the role of the heart and the, and the role of the Christian life in theology over against a highly scholastic theology that's all rational and all creedal. Um, I actually think pietism is an impulse in Christianity, which is a renewing impulse, um, and believe that when we look at monastic movements, definitely when we look at uh, movements towards piety of the Reformation, um, even some of the works that we're finding in liberation and indigenous theology today, you see this call back to the role of emotions alongside uh, correct thinking about God. You see the importance of community. You see the importance of you know, living this out, embodying the, the, the gospel. And so I think wherever you find kind of this return to an embodiment again, a warm-hearted piety, okay, so to, speaking to a good Wesleyan brother here, uh, I think you're experiencing that, that, that pietist impulse. So there's both an impulse, and I think there is a, a very specific moment in church history where we see something called pietism emerge. And what is it in history? Because, of course, you know, you're talking about, I mean, I, I, how many people who sit in the pews relate to this? Uh, a heartfelt faith. I mean, th that's what they are. That's what that's that impulse, you know. Yeah. Um, what what is it in certain periods of church history where pietism has sort of emerged as a movement? What's been happening at that moment that you have this emergence? Well, this is interesting. You know, my, my dissertation is, is in Brethren Theology, so I'm an ordained elder in the Brethren Church, and Brethren are an amalgam of, of Anabaptism and, and radical pietism, and we can have that conversation about distinct camps going on there. Right. Um, but it's fascinating to me. Pietism e emerges, uh, or this impulse emerges, uh, when two things seem to be happening. Uh, number one, the church has been too co-opted by empire, um, and so it looks too much like the world, uh, looks too much like the state, and doesn't look like the alternative people of God, which sounds very Anabaptist. And actually, the early Anabaptists were quite pious. Read the, the writings of Menno Simons. He's a very pious thinker. Uh, he's a horrific writer, but he's a very pious thinker. I have his uh, writings, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard. What are you talking about now, Simons? But um, but uh, the but there's also historically pietism emerges uh, after second generation Lutheranism, um, and it emerges as a, as a, a hope to rediscover again the the founding charism that animated Luther. Uh, this this call of, of, of the, the role of, of the heart, the role of, of a lived experience of theology, uh, because what had occurred is you had a rigid confessionalization of, of Lutheran theology. Believe these things, okay, by mental assent, and you're in. Um, and it had kind of, what Pietists would call, it had formed a dead orthodoxy. Um, and so the earliest Pietists are really trying to bring Reformation to the Reformation, because they become too scholastic and too cognitive. Um, and so we have the writings of Johann Arndt, uh, who's right about true Christianity as a lived experience of Christ. Uh, and actually, the one of the most famous pietists is Philip Jakob Spener. Uh, his Pia de Cederia, uh was actually an introduction to Arndt's work uh, originally. Uh, and and here's, what, here's what Spener's doing, Alan. He's, he's calling for, for really radical things. Small groups. Uh, intentional, like, Bible study. Maybe after the sermon is preached, we gather and we talk about it, <laughs> okay? Uh, and then Spainer, and then you get to August Hem and Franca, uh, who are talking about we need to establish schools and do missions work. Uh, actually, the, the, the vision of Spain, Spainer and Franca is, is so this-worldly that it's almost comical that pietism gets labeled as being otherworldly. Uh, it was really about if we have an experience of Christ, it should mark our lives and we should live in a distinct way. Yeah. And it's interesting when you talk this way, because we've had, when we've had, you and I have talked about this a lot um, over the, over the last two or three years. And that is, is that in Wesleyanism, you know, Wesley deeps, uh, drinks deeply from the well of Morav Moravians and, yes, you know, all the, the, all those connections, you know, uh, those branches that are coming from one, one trunk and, um, uh, really influenced him as far as the religion of the heart, as far as uh, 
as Wesley likes to talk about, the inward witness of the spirit. Um, and you you would be hard pressed to to accuse John Wesley of being otherworldly completely and well, yeah, concerned. Wesley talks about concerned. social holiness. He talks about social holiness and he talks yes. and he's he's you know he's in he's in London starting schools for kids and feeding kids and you know concerned about all of this and and yet it does get labeled that way. So let's talk just a little bit about that misunder <laughs> misunderstanding. Because, by the way, again, the conversation you and I have had is that there are some big names who, in Christian theological reflection, who have dissed pietism, and you and I are of the opinion they don't understand it. So, you know, Karl Barth is one of them. We're both fans of Barth, and yeah. we're both fans of Stanley Harwas, who has yes, yes, who has dissed pietism. And what is it that they misunderstand? in in the, when they talk about it yeah what it's they're they're both reacting to to a theologian of of the late 19th uh century named friedrich schleiermacher uh and liberal theology uh liberal theology really grabs a hold of pietism and pietism goes from a capital p to a lowercase p uh, and so I always like to say that Bart and Hauerwas are reacting to pietism, lowercase p, uh, this um, kind of going inward, this kind of, you know, Schleiermacher talked about that really faith is just the feeling of absolute dependence on God. Uh, so the world can go to hell in a handbasket, but as long as I'm okay internally with Jesus, okay, we've heard this talk. Because the irony of all irony is that really conservative evangelicals have drank deeply up from yeah. the Kool-Aid of liberal theology. Um, and so in many ways, Schleiermacher and Kant have won. Uh, we've reduced faith down to an inward feeling and, you know, do some good works and we're good to go. <laughs> and so Bart and Hauerwas, and really I should say Bart's reacting to Hauerwas is just, he's just learned from Bart. Um about a about an understanding of faith that really doesn't make a difference in the world uh you know so it's just a you know what was said of the of the anabaptists in america and early american history often was they were simply the quiet in the land uh so you're all about maintaining your purity and your faith journey uh but meanwhile there are broken systems in the world what is the response of the people of god to that uh and so what happens is schleiermacher's liberal theological project gets kind of lumped under pietism mm -hmm. lowercase p mm -hmm. and i think bart is bart has an appreciation for schleiermacher but he's also reacting and i think rather correctly uh although it's a distorted version he's reacting to a uh, a a truncated gospel uh that the early pietists would not have fully would have not have spader and franca would not have understood this as the gospel at all he is reacting to Schleiermacher's understanding of piety in which Schleiermacher himself misunderstands piety, right? Yeah, and, 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 and piety is, for Schleiermacher, piety becomes all about an emotional experience. Yeah. Uh, for the pietist, and this is really important, for the pietist, it's, it is about a transformed life. That is, that is a fundamental impulse to pietism, a transformed life. The... Schleiermacher gives us it's this this a uh, it's a a faith feeling, if you will, um, and clearly you know we anybody listening to this knows faith is more than feelings because feelings yeah. give way yeah. quickly, uh, and so I understand what who uh, that Bart's reaction to it, but the funny thing, Alan, if I may say this, Bart Bart's theology is actually quite pietist, and he's shaped by pietist. Uh, he's shaped by the Bloomarks. Uh, who are, they are a, a, a German pietist father and son um, who are, are seeking to, to live out their faith in a way to, to bring, you know, renewal uh, to their, to their area. Um, and so Bart drinks deeply uh, from, from the Bloomhart's theology. Uh, and so Bart's call to a Christocentrism, Bart's call to live out the way of Jesus, Bart's call to even forming the church dogmatics, you know, the idea of, of a church who live out the way of Christ. This is all pie, from a pietist impulse. Uh, and so there have been some more recent scholarship. Uh, Christian Collins Wynn, uh, a, a theologian out of Bethel University, has written extensively about this is a hole in Bart's theology, that Bart doesn't realize how much he actually owes the Bloom Hearts. Yeah. Uh, so he's, and in many ways, what's happening is, if I can say it this way, 
Bart is reacting to lowercase pietism with the uppercase pietism of the Bloom Hearts. Okay, gotcha. So he's using a a, 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 a more historical understanding of pietism to uh, critique pietism, a certain yeah. kind of pietism. Yeah, yeah. You know, I we get this all the time. You know, I, you talk about the, the, the evangelical context, drinking deeply from the wells of liberal theology, and we both know uh, that uh, modern liberalism and modern conservatism are just two sides of the same modernist coin, right? Yeah. Uh, to the consternation of people on both sides when you say that. But it is true that that they start with a lot of a similar assumptions and they actually have solutions. They actually think their way toward the solution in the same way. It's just that they they come to a different solution that's just part of the modern ethos, right? The modern yeah. reflection. Um, but I can, you know, I mean, I grew up in an evangelical context. I, there's a lot of, there was, a, you know, I know there are some people who felt like they grew up in that context and were abused, and maybe they were, you know, there are certainly churches that are not, and church leaders who are not healthy. But um, I grew up in that context, and I it was positive for me in many ways. But the one frustration for me and I think this gets at the pietism with the little p. And that is, is that I, from the time I was a kid, I was always a seeker. I was always asking questions. And I know all kids ask questions, but I'm asking like, you know, I mean, right. I mean, I still have this uh, memory of being about five years old and we're driving home from church one Sunday night. And I can remember my mom and dad having a conversation about a couple in the church that had been in a bad car accident. And, came th and they came through with just some scratches. And they were talking about it and saying how God was with them. And I piped up from the back seat and said, well, if they'd have been killed, would that mean that God wasn't with them, right? These are the kinds yeah. of questions I asked. My father yeah. finally told me I asked too many questions. But, <laughs> but you know, growing up, when you grow up a seeker in, 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 a, in a pietist with a little P movement, it really is not encouraged to seek and to ask questions. And, you know, and I would get I would get things like, well, just pray about it or, you know, uh, you just have to believe. Well, you know, mm -hmm. you, I mean, you know, again. Um, anyway, so and it exists today. I posted something on social media the other day that basically was an answer to a question I get from followers people who follow me on social media is why am I a Christian? And my short answer is because I believe Jesus has been bodily raised from the dead. And if there's no bodily raised Jesus, there's no Christianity. And I got this long post from somebody who basically said he had this wonderful experience of Jesus when he was young and it's been through his ministry and basically saying, I don't need reasons. I don't need logic, you know, to which I want to say to him as a Wesleyan, first of all, I think it's great you've had this experience, right? This transformative experience of Jesus, even when, as you were a young child. But that doesn't mean you should put your powers of reason, you, you know, on the shelf. You don't, you know, as, as I like to quote uh, somebody who said a long time ago, Christ died to take away our sins, not our minds. Yeah, and, absolutely. And so pietism, you know, there are people on the outside that look at that kind of expression of pietism and, and no wonder they don't want it because they think you got to you've got to you've got to crucify everything that makes you think. Yeah. And and I. And I I grew up in that in a very similar world, Alan, where yeah. it was okay, just just pray more about it. Uh, just just read your Bible more uh, and those kind of things. And and I, I think, you know, historically there. There are two branches within pietism. There, there were the churchly pietists and there were the radical pietists. Uh, and I think that my story, my denomination, my tradition story kind of speaks to what we're talking about here. Uh, the the brethren, excuse the siren in the background there, the, the brethren. As long the, as they're not coming for you, Jason, we're good. We don't know. We don't <laughs> know. Don't rule anything out. Um, but uh, the, the, the brethren began as radical pietists. They began kind of as a breakaway group. They, they meet. Radical pietism uh, was a, a a pietist theology that said the church is so broken that we we need to kind of do away with visible structures. Uh, they always get hijacked by the world, and so this was a very spiritual kind of movement. Um, and so, and usually there were itinerant ministers, and usually tend to be more on the mystical edge, uh, who are are kind of 
traveling throughout uh, Reformation Europe, um, and they're developing kind of little small groups uh, with people who are disgruntled with the established church. And so early Brethren leaders, like the founder of the Brethren Church, Alexander Mack, uh, come into conversation. But it's interesting because Mack and the followers who gather around the itinerant minister, uh, this minister's name, he has a great name, Ernst Christoph Hockmann von Hockenau. No, I love uh, it. I love we it. don't name kids like we don't name kids well anymore. Okay, but uh, his and his brother so, was John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt, right? I mean, seriously, <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. that's a great name. Yeah, and, they kept, and they kept squaring off about whose land it was. But anyway, <laughs> uh, but uh, so, <laughs> but the Mac and the, and, and the early brethren quickly saw what what you and I are talking about. Wait a minute, this is it's very internal, um, it's very spiritual. But when we when we look when we return to the New Testament, we go there's there's a visible witness here. The church is called to look different. So I define early brethren uh, this Anabaptist radical pietist. They are radical pietists who are moving towards Anabaptism, and they found conversation partners with German Mennonites and Swiss brethren. Um, and so the brethren are quickly becoming an Anabaptist denomination quite early because of what we're talking about here. Yeah, and I think definitely uh, Schleiermacher and others. Uh, would have been very much at home in radical pietism, uh, a very spiritual movement. Um, it's very difficult to define it. It's very mystical. Uh, the role of the affections is 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 is, is very strong. Um, but it's interesting when you look at the churchly pietists. This is where Spainer and Franca would fall. Uh, this is not them at all. They are establishing the University of Halle. I mean they. They're establishing schools of learning. Uh, they're our Bible societies, our Great Awakenings, our our modern missions movement, all comes out of this. Mm. The the Wesleyanism that becomes Methodism in America, and actually that changes America from being a predominantly Calvinist nation to an Arminian nation. Yeah, uh, this is all because of the spread of this Pietist spirit that is not otherworldly at all. Uh, yeah. Actually. You know, and so pietism, you know, it's I always think it's important uh, to remember a few things about it. Number one, in the in the American evangelical context, we have done a lot of work on a lot of work on the reformed influence on American evangelicalism through the Puritans, through Presbyterianism. But there's been a whole other group that we have not always given the attention that's due then, because like I just said. Methodism changes the religious landscape in America. I mean, Methodism yeah. is a is a revolution in America. Yeah. Uh, and in many ways, you and I have had this conversation. Wesley probably wouldn't fully recognize Methodism. Uh, and so, but, <laughs> yeah. <okay>. but, <laughs> but that's that's another podcast. For that's life. another but, podcast for another time. Yes. But so, but you've had this revolutionary force, but the evangelical story has been told through Reformed scholars. What about Methodism? What about Pentecostalism. Uh, th these yeah. are all pietist movements that I think actually we need to be listening to these voices more now. Yeah. Um, and so and so what happens is you this this churchly pietist, it's it's marked by important impulses that I think we need to hold on to in this current cultural moment. Uh, yeah. It's ironic in spirit. And what I mean by that, it's always aiming towards peace. Uh, pietism wants wants to cooperate, wants to find agreement. Um, it's, it has hope for better times. Uh, this, this animates Spainer and Franca that they really do believe that actually that they can, they can bring reform to the church. Uh, they can bring, bring reform to Christianity in Europe. Um, and so there, there's, there's a hopefulness to it. There's a communal nature to it. It's not just me and Jesus and we're fine. It's the idea we're doing this in small groups and that the church really is a large group that's made up of small groups. I mean, so there, there's very much a this worldly way of manifesting, incarnating, embodying the way of Jesus in the here and now that I think is really important for Christianity in America that has become so, uh, well, it's, it's believe the right things and you're in, mm -hmm. uh, and, or it's just an inward feeling that's unchecked by community, <laughs> unchecked by any source outside of the self. Uh, and I think these are things that I think pietism, uh, if a, a word that I would use to describe it in its churchly sense, not necessarily its radical sense, 
Pietism is a theology of integration, mm -hmm. bringing all the parts together. So you better believe your mind is a part of this because we're called to love the Lord with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yes, exactly, exactly. That leads to sort of two questions, uh, two subjects as you say this. You know, and I remember many years ago because you talked about uh, uh, the Reformation and Protestantism being seen mostly through the eyes of the re Reformed movement. Mm -hmm. um, I remember as a young student there at Ash here at Ashland Seminary uh, asking a certain professor you and I both know very well, um, who is now retired and uh, is um, one of those persons who I've said, if I had to name someone that I have known who actually has achieved Wesley's understanding of perfection in this life, it would be him <laughs> <laughs> and, his, and his wife. And so you know who I'm talking about. But I asked him because he was my theology professor. I said, well, we're at an Anabaptist school here. How come so much of our theology that we're reading is coming through Reformed eyes? Mm -hmm. You know, to which his response was, well, because Anabaptists just, aren't writing a lot of this stuff you know they're right it's not that they're not writing it's that that you know if you want to if you want to anabaptist systematic theology it's going to be hard to find one well and, and and anabaptism has not fared well first off anabaptism does not fare well in 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 modernity modernity yes. is far too individualistic uh and in many ways pietism has been hijacked by that individuality um and so it's difficult to do Anabaptist theology in an American evangelical context that doesn't really understand church. I mean, evangelicals go to church to express themselves and to get fed. That's all very individualistic yeah. thinking there. And I'm not saying that's, that's not that's not important. It's just an incomplete ecclesiology. So it's, it's a very oh, yeah. narrow, anemic ecclesiology. But we're wired for politics. We're wired to be in community. This is why I think evangelicals have enough theology to go out and baptize a political party because they find their political witness through American politics and they bring their religious certainty and fervor to that project, uh, which is a yeah. dangerous combination. Well, I've um, said I've said for a long time it's not just evangelicals, it's mainline Protestants that that for so you know, many Alan, of you us, know this and you're right. Yeah. So ma many of us, uh, so for many Christians, America is their functional church. Right. Yeah. I mean, they may think of the church down the street where they go to. No, that's my church. Well, functionally, America is your church. Um, and we could explicate that. That brings me to my next question that's related. You you talk about uh, pietists believing the Reformation hadn't gone far enough. Uh, mm -hmm. And I agree with that. I'm, I'm a fan of that. And you talk about the idea of, the, you know, not even having any structures because the structures always get co-opted. I mean, you really cannot understand pietism historically apart from its rejection or at least its concern about Christendom. It's concerned that, you know, uh, we want to run the world and be in charge because those structures are embedded with nation state politics. Well, and I, I think, um, Alan, you, you kind of named the reason why I am an Anabaptist who has a deep affinity for pietism, because I think the two need to go together. Uh, I can take you to Anabaptist circles in America right now, uh, which the Anabaptist way has been reduced down to peace and service. That's all there is to it. Peace and service. Service. Yep. And so can you, it's, can, it's you, very, can, can you pull yeah. that out a little bit? It's it's a it is just it's pretty much an Anabaptist ethic. It's not really an Anabaptist theology. Um, and, and I'm, I definitely am, you know, I, I am a, my tradition is non-resistant. I'm non-resistant. Um, and, um, and I definitely care about justice and I care about service. Uh, but those flow out of a transformed life and a transformed community by the risen Christ. Um, so that I, I do that in partnership with God by his spirit. Um, it's not a matter of, I don't bring the anxiety of the moment to be able to bear on those, those areas there. And for me personally, I don't understand peace apart from Jesus Christ. I mean, that's, uh, right. and that's an, that's an eschatological awareness that we have as, as, as Christ followers. Um, but I, I, I think that when you, when you separate piety from the church, uh, what you have is you have this kind of vapid kind of radical pietism right now in, in the moment. You have really evangelicalism has it, it has internally American evangelicalism. Uh, I see it has 
has kind of an internal, um, I don't, I'm trying to use, tension's not a strong enough word here uh, because the, the combination is rather combustible. Uh, you have a hyper Calvinist certainty alongside a radical pietist uh, fervor or feeling. Um, and, and you've kind of brought those two together in a context that doesn't invite submission to a community or to a church. Yeah. Uh, and you have a dangerous combination in your hands here. And so when I talk about people ask me, well, what do pietists believe? Um, and and this is this is in my dissertation that fancy title. There was a word in there that a phrase that I, I think is really important: theological epistemology. And what that really means is, how do we know what we know about God? Um, and I think Pietism has a lot to say here. Um, if you go to the too far to the reform side, what it comes down to is a I check these right boxes, and that's it's it's all mental assent. Yeah. Um, and for another time, another place, we got to have a conversation about that. I think that sola fide, justification by faith, uh, we need to have a robust conversation about that. Uh, yeah. Because faith for Luther, faith of the Reformation was not just merely mental assent. Uh, but what, what I, uh, the theologian I've been shaped by in my awareness of pietist belief has been Roger Olson, who's a retired professor mm -hmm. out, out of Baylor and George Truett Seminary there. Uh, he and Christian Collins Wynn wrote a book on uh, uh, reclaiming pietism, the retrieval of an evangelical tradition. It's a great <laughs> book. Uh, but Olson talks about epistemology as posture. And, and what, I, what he means by that is, let me kind of, let's go back to scripture a little bit. In the book of Galatians, you have an anxiety around identity. Uh, you have Jewish Christians who say, yeah, I get this whole Jesus thing, but we also need to adhere to the law. And then you have Gentile Christians who are kind of going, no, I, I, we don't need to adhere to the law. We have Jesus. Uh, and it's all based around identity. Okay. Mm -hmm. How do we know who's in and who's out? Uh, and the law was a really powerful way to be able to determine you're in or you're not. Uh, and it's fascinating. Paul responds is pretty much, you know, we've all been crucified with Christ. The law has been crucified with Christ because Christ fulfilled the law. Okay. Then, well, it doesn't do away with the anxiety. How do we know who's in? And Paul says, you'll know because you'll see the fruit of the Spirit. Hmm. Love, joy, peace, patience. That is what Pietism is talking about. It's an epistemology as posture. And I think this has been lost in American Christianity. How, so the old hymn, you know, they will know we are Christians by our love. Okay. The re, how I know that you really do believe this is because you are marked by it. Your life is different because of it. You lived a transformed life. And so... Epistemology is not just merely, how do I know what I know? Well, Christianity does not invite you into epistemology that's entirely rational. You have to live into this story. You have to embody it. Our bodies matter in this. And so pietism reminds us that it is a warm-hearted piety that transforms the individual and community from the inside out. It can't just stay internal. It can't just be about me and Jesus, we're fine. Because Jesus would say, you and I aren't fine if you have disdain for your neighbor. Yeah. Uh, and so again, it's a holistic, integrated gospel that says, you know that I know this because my life reflects it. Yeah, and um, so here, yeah, and so here's part of the other problem I think that gets happened in all of this. It gets, it gets, uh, sort of gets us off the path when we think about pietism is, um, the the warm heart, right? John Wesley's heart was strangely warmed, gets interpreted in the 21st century West as sentimental sentimental feelings, this sentimentality. You'll they'll know you are Christians by your love is interpreted again sentimentally, you know, um, where when it's very clear from Jesus, I mean, <laughs> when Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you, well, this is the kind of love that's going to get you strung up on a cross if you're not careful. Yes. And Wesley, I mean, the the warm heart is not just about I've got a, this little nice little good feeling to help me take it through today, think, get through the day. There's something much more deeper and profound about this notion of the warm heart. Isn't that right? Yes. And it's, you know, for for Wesley, when Wesley uses phrases like warm heart, I mean, I, I'm preaching to the choir here. I mean, he, he's talking about a transformative experience. Yeah. 
Uh, and, you know, a, a word that we use a lot here at National Seminary, and Alan, you and I have been around this area for quite some time, but I think it's a, a word that's desperately needed is, is transformation. Yeah. That is that is the goal of the gospel. And so what I think pipes remind us, Alan, here, you know, as, as we, you know, we, we have both swam in the evangelical streams and, and there's there's a, there's a tremendous amount of good in the evangelical stream. Uh, yeah. I and I, I I'm definitely I'm at home in it, even in its dysfunction. Uh, but. I feel that way about mainline Protestantism. So, you know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, that's, why, that's, why I call my, that's why I call myself a theologian in exile anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I, I think I think it's a really fair way to describe yourself and it's how I describe myself. Yeah. Uh, and in this in this time in American life, I feel theologically and politically homeless at times. Yeah. I don't know where I'm supposed to go. But I think what what true pietism reminds us, Alan, is conversion. And this is biblical. <laughs> and this is what I love about Pied. Oh no! Oh no! You're gonna you're, you're gonna right. talk Bible now. Yeah. Gee, where are you, where are you yeah, gonna yeah, go yeah. next, Jason? Here we go! Here we go! Here we go! Here we go! Here we go. Mm, <laughs> channeling. Okay. Yeah, you know, I could be a revivalist minister, and you just shake my hand, and you're in. Okay, but uh, well, the, I got a, I don't know about you, but I got a membership card, so we're good. Anyway, <laughs> go conversion, ahead. Conversion is the indwelling of the Spirit. Yeah. Um, and I think you know one of the things my tradition stresses is that. Conversion is a lifelong process. Um, and when you have a revivalistic understanding of conversion, coupled with a, uh, a very charismatic worship, coupled with a very reformed understanding of belief, uh, I don't know about you, but it, it kind of it kind of leaves you wanting a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and especially because we, we know that that does, if we're honest with ourselves, we know that does not match with the lived experience of the faith that's yeah. marked by suffering, that's marked by, uh, you know, the, things don't always turn out the way that we want them to. Um, that's, you know, in Eugene Peterson's language, it really is a long obedience in the same direction. Uh, and so pietism reminds us that, no, every day that I get up, I have to, I'm inviting the spirit to change me, convert yeah. me. Um, and, and what that does, Alan, I think, which is really important in this moment is if I daily recognize that I need conversion, what I, I've called it, uh, I wrote an article and I called this conversionary discipleship, the lifelong process of, of being converted into the image of Jesus Christ. I heard I had a pastor one time that, that, that discipleship is a lifelong journey of being depaganized. Uh, and, and I really like that language a lot. Um, then how it marks me is that I, I recognize that my faith is not based on rational certainty. I can't prove Jesus Christ is Lord, I have, I, but I have profound confidence that he is. But confidence is a relational word. Right. Certainty is not. And so if I have a confidence, and I'm inviting the Spirit to convert me, it marks my life with humility. Um, it it makes, makes me realize that I'm not complete in and of myself, and that's okay. Um, it means that I need other people speaking into my life because I know that my story is not complete. Um, but it also at the same time honors my lived experience. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm not saying here that experience is unimportant, but you and I've had this conversation experience as the sole authority. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know on practical matters. I don't know how we move forward as, as a society. If, if, if individual experience is the final authority on absolutely everything. Well, you just hit a real sore spot with me because I get really tired about how my United Methodist tradition uses the word experience because it's just, it just drives me crazy. It's supposed to be one of our sources of authority. Oh, yeah. Uh, from, yes. from the Wesleyan quadrilateral, that it's not a quadrilateral. Um, uh, nor is it Wesleyan. That's another, you know, that's another when subject. I first, but, when I first discovered the Wesleyan quadrilateral, I, I had this thought of like, <laughs> like circuit riders who would go into a church and all, and they're doing geometry on a chalkboard with the people of God. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, my problem really was more philosophical in that the idea is of experience is something separate from everything else that you can paste on the wall. It just is not the way it works. I mean, I mean, one of the reasons we believe Scripture is the canon is what it is is because the church has said in our experience, right. Yes. This is this is 
you know, God's word to us in a way that no other documents are God's word. So you can't have something called experience, you know, separate from that. So that just drives me crazy. But the other thing, let me get back to your comment about grace. The other thing that irritates me about my United Methodist tradition is, you know, Wesley, you're right. He was all about grace's transformation. We don't talk about grace that way. We really don't. And, and, um, well, but in many ways, Alan, I don't know if it'd be fair to say, I mean, in some ways, you know, the Wesleyan understanding of sanctification got so hijacked by the holiness movements. Yeah. Uh, and, and the second work of grace language, uh, you know, but you're absolutely, I mean, Wesley talks about a transformative experience that leads to that social holiness that we talked about. He refers are, to sanctifying grace, right? Yes. Yeah. So anyway, that's another thing. So, um, but I think it's important to to emphasize the idea too. The other thing about that is is that when you talk about sanctification itself as being grace, it is a reminder to us again that this is God's work. You know, at the end of the day, it isn't my work. I just have to be willing to cooperate, right? Uh, which is often well, a problem. And, and, well, and, and I think you know when you when you look at the Pietists, when you look at the look at look at Wesley, definitely. Um, I don't know, there's just a word that comes to mind when I look at them is is, is there's just joy in the work, yeah. um, and and you know it's it's one of those things of it's it's like when people come to me you know and, and they go, hey listen we know that in scripture that there was a call to peace, uh, but I just don't think peace is going to work in the climate they're in right now, and I'm always like you do realize that they were under like the 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 Roman empire, uh, calling for this, but okay, fine. You know? And so it's a, you know, it's so what I hear a lot of times is, yeah, but our, our issues are just so big in America right now. Yeah. Uh, that you're talking about joy and this kind of, and hope, uh, it just falls on deaf ears. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, on one hand, I, I understand. And I, I think Wesley is a good, a good voice here. Um, that, don't just say thoughts and prayers because you want to absolve yourself of being involved in the solution. Right. Okay. There is an inner and an outward working here. Okay. But at the same time, I want to be people who are marked by prayer, uh, who feel the joy of the Holy spirit, who are, I mean, grace is a renewing force. The spirit is interceding for us. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I, I think pietism helps make sure that the works that we're doing uh, don't become all just burden and obligation. There is a sense in which, I mean, hope is hope to me is is very is is very different than optimism. Yes, Pietism, lowercase p, liberal theology is optimism, and it's 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 microwaved optimism. Okay, yeah. because we you know it didn't really taste good the first time. Nuke it again. Okay, and we keep on microwaving optimism again and again. I'll tell you right now, I'm not optimistic about the world at all. Yeah. Uh, because optimism is human progress absent the involvement of God. Yeah. But I think biblically, hope grounds us to the fact that God is involved in the world by his spirit. Yeah. Um, and pietism, I, I, you know, my friend Chris Garrett, who teaches that he's a history professor at, uh, at, at Bethel, Uni Bethel University as well. Bethel, by the way, is doing a lot of work in pietism. Uh, Chris wrote uh, a more popular book called The Pietist Option. Uh, on on just pietism for American Christianity today. He also wrote a book on a pietist vision for Christian higher education. Uh, but Chris really has brought down and said, actually, the slogan of pietism is uh, is hope for better times. Yeah. Um, and um, it's, it's that hope that, that gets us up in the morning and, and it says the work that you and I do does matter because it matters to God. And I love your connection uh, saying that this is a this is a joyful work. Um, and. Yeah. Uh, which, which, which hence my comment at the beginning of our conversation that humor and piety go together. There is a, yes. there is a joy in this work. Um, and uh, we need we to can, see we, it. We cannot, we cannot take ourselves too seriously. Oh my gosh. Uh, we, we need a and, lot and, less of that. And Alan, I mean, you, you and I spend time stomping around the Academy. Okay. So uh, talk about a place where people are just hardwired to take themselves too seriously. Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But to hold on to things, to hold on to things lightly, and and hope reminds us that, you know, uh, hope reminds us that if I look behind me, 
Christ is victorious through his resurrection. Uh, and I also say his ascension and gifting of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Those always right. get left out right. all the time. Okay? That's right. Uh, and look ahead of us. Yeah. He's victorious in, this, in his second coming. Yeah. We are literally bookended, which means not that we can just check out and go, okay, God's got this. But we can actually be, we can prayerfully answer the needs of the world. Um, yeah. Do our small part, knowing that ultimately the victory is not ours to be had anyway. The victory yeah. is Christ's. Uh, but yeah. we can we can begin to a word I like to use is we can cultivate. We can kind of till up the soil around us. Uh, we can aerate the soil so that the the seed of the gospel can be planted and people can have a transforming encounter with yeah. the risen Christ. Yeah. Is there anything more joyful that right. we get to do than that? That's exactly right, and that's that's uh, that's just a, a wonderful uh, way to just talk about this. I have a I have actually a small book coming out on holiness. I don't know when next month or two or three. That's shameless self promotion, folks. Um, a no, small no, book that's shame. Yeah. on holiness, in which the thesis of the book is that Wesley's understanding of holiness is our holiness is our loving response to the God who first loved us. That's hey. it. It's not drudgery. It's not a, primarily a list of do's and don'ts, although that's included. It's not. It's not uh, you know looking holy, whatever that might look like. It's. It's living a life that you want to please God because God has loved us first. And I want to please the one whom I love. Those of us who are married know that, right? We want to please yeah, the one we yes. love. And so it's, we it's need a, to recover a, that joy. It's a loving obedience. It's a loving obedience. We need, you know, the other thing in reference to that, you talked about uh, somebody saying about viol nonviolence and that doesn't work today. Uh, as, as, if it, as if there was a time when, when, Nonviolence work right. ever, right? Seriously, <laughs> right? But but uh, our friend Stanley Harawas says that the Sermon on the Mount is not about what works, but the way God expects us to live. Plain and simple. Yeah, and, it's not about what works, and, it's what's what God wants from us. And if you remember, he goes even further and says the Sermon on the Mount is a picture of who God is. Yes. This is what this is what our God is like. These are yeah. these are the pop. You know, so I, a shameless plug, I'm working on a book now on cruciform friendship, Alan. Yeah. Uh, because friendship is, again, uh, you talked about love earlier, things that have been distorted in the, in the modern conversation. Yeah. Uh, conversations around beauty, attraction, and love. Well, we in the West, we sexualize everything. Yes, we uh, do. And so we've lost the, 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 the art of friendship. Um, and what passes for friendship is just a way that, I spew all my anxiety on you and you spew all your anxiety on me. And we don't create space for the other. Where the invitation of Jesus, if you recall in, in, in the Gospel of John, Jesus, he he is, when he talks about the crucifixion and in those in, in the farewell discourse, he uses language of friendship to describe what he's doing. Yes. So the idea of true Christian friendship as I die to self with Christ, in Christ. I'm gifted my true self by the spirit. And through that relationship of cruciformity, to use Michael Gorman in New Testament theologians language, uh, I, I, I'm now allowed to create space where you and I can actually truly commune. We can find union yeah. with one another in the spirit. And this is yeah. all motivated out, out of my out of my warm hearted piety, yeah. uh, longing to experience intimacy and friendship with people. Yeah. Um, and I, I think the more and more I look at this and I see this kind of this ironic spirit, this hope for better times, uh, this this wanting to have a, a li living, vibrant faith. Uh, I I just and when I'm in conversation yeah. with folks, people long for this. Uh, we it's funny. There's a there's a, a, a little book that came out uh, a few years ago where a few sociologists were looking at what does it really take to change somebody's mind? Yeah. Um, and what they found is when they reduced down all the data, the only thing that changes our minds is a sense of awe, A-W-E. Mm. Um, so we have awe that changes people's minds, but because of liberalism, we live in a closed box where there's nothing beyond us. Uh, no wonder we don't change our minds. Yeah. But then you talk about a people who have been animated by warm-hearted piety, have had a transformative encounter with the risen Christ, whose lives live as an intersection of the transcendence, transcendent and the imminent. 
who come into their neighborhoods, maybe just maybe our, we could be a pietist mission that inspires awe that might actually help God's spirit change minds. Yeah. So, so pietism, other than it's not an otherworldly thing to me, it actually is part of the solution to our current cultural moment, especially yeah. in, in America right now, uh, where we uh, have certain individuals who have just said they're going to run for president again, and we begin this cycle all over again. Yeah. 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 Well, I think that's a good place to wrap things up uh, on friendship. I certainly appreciate your friendship, Jason. I cherish the times you and I have together in the conversations. Really, uh, it's so yeah. And um, is there any anything finally you want to say about pietism? I mean, if there's somebody that really says, you know, this is interesting, I'd like to learn a little more about pietism in the historic sense. I mean, what what are you got any recommendations? The, the 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 best work work that I've found and it, it's more popular in fashion would be the, the the pietist option and maybe Alan we can get that link sent to that that text the pietist uh, written option. by Hitcher, yeah the, and the subtitle is hope for the renewal of Christianity okay. my gosh isn't that a phrase that we link when we latch yeah. onto yeah but uh, it's my buddy Chris Gertz um, who is a, a history professor but he actually wrote it with it was he and his pastor. Um, and who was a pastor of an evangelical covenant church. Um, and so it's it's very popular. It's very pastoral in its orientation. Uh, but you'll leave the book going, yeah, this Christianity is indeed a, a force for good. Uh, and so, yeah, I, that's where I would recommend starting. Okay. Well, we'll put that uh, link in the descriptions on the, on the YouTube channel, on the podcast, along with uh, a link to your... Uh, blog on sub on substack con, a brethren contemplative I, or is a contemplative brethren which one are you it's 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 brethren contemplative uh, brethren and, contemplative okay and and the way i describe it is i i i take a very uh frederick beekner approach to ah. theology uh, beekner you know lived by the philosophy that all theology is somewhat autobiographical yep and so by inviting people to go into the particulars of his life they would find universal truth um, and so it really is my attempt to kind of just explore uh, my faith journey, my theology, somewhat autobiographically, mm -hmm. um, then gleaning large themes that I look at. So, for example, currently I'm in a series. I'm looking through educators in my life that inspired me to go into education and theological education specifically and just reflecting and going, what did I really glean from them? Yeah. As far back as first grade, what was I learning as I was writing in cursive on the chalkboard? Uh, and this really, again, is this is the pietist side of me uh, coming yeah. out, uh, lip, just trying to mine experience for experiences, for, for revelations of the holy. Um, wow. Okay. And so if you're interested in that kind of journey, uh, then I invite you to, to look at my blog. And I, I actually, I think, I think pietism would say, uh, start your own journey. Yeah. Uh, we will link to that. Um, as, as when you said that, I was thinking of James McClendon, who wrote a book many years ago entitled Biography as Theology. Biography as Theology. Yeah. And uh, he he was one among others who helped me to start thinking about theology in that way. McClendon was a powerhouse. He is. Yeah. I've been deeply shaped by McClendon. Yes. Yes. And uh, for good reason. All right. Friend, Jason, thank you for this time. And appreciate it. Uh, friends, this is Faith Seeking Understanding. I am Alan Bevere. And a reminder, as I always do at the end of every podcast, um, that the patron saint of Faith Seeking Understanding is Anselm of Canterbury, who said, I do not understand in order to believe, but I believe in order to understand. So I say to all of you, keep seeking and have a great day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.